Good morning, everyone. Um, so um, I just have to start out by sharing something that God put on my heart this morning during prayer with um, before service. Um, last night was so powerful, right? If those of you who are there. Um, and as we were praying this morning, I just really felt like I saw um, a war zone that was completely defeated. The enemy is down. You know, like those movies you see, the war, the, um, war is over and they're clearing the battlefield of all the dead bodies. And um, I just think spiritually, we had victory last night. And yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think God's calling us to walk through that battlefield and keep our eyes on the horizon for the next battle, to be prepared, to, to celebrate this one, but to remember that we have many more to come and that he will give us victory every time. He's never lost a battle. And um, so with that, I just want to pray uh, before I begin. Lord, thank you. Thank you for being enthroned on our praises. Thank you for showing us what you're doing, just little glimpses, Lord, to keep us moving. Keep giving us hope for the next thing to come, and I pray that we are faithful to look to you for every promise, to remember everything that you tell us. Lord, I pray that we would prepare our hearts, that you would help us to see deep within our own lives so that we can successfully move on to the next battle and not build up the walls of the battle that we just finished, but that we would continue to crush the enemy under our feet and know that you're bringing us into another victory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, so what was on my heart to share with you guys today is um, I was studying a lot in Deuteronomy, and like Barb and I, oh my goodness, I, I'm just sitting there going, oh great, that's the same thing I'm talking about. So thank you, Holy Spirit, for the unity that he's given us. But, um, you know, Moses wrote Deuteronomy. It was kind of like um, an overview of everything that they've been through. And they're getting ready to cross over the Jordan into the promised land. And he's giving them some wisdom, some advice, helping them remember where they've been. And um, he reminded them of the Ten Commandments. And when God was giving the Ten Commandments, he was up on the mountain. And I'm not sure... Um, if the Israelites could hear God's audible voice, but I know they heard something. They either heard like the commandments that God was speaking or they heard this loud thundering, you know, God's presence. And when they heard that, they were terrified. And they were terrified in a way where they said, we're all gonna die. Like, they, they're like, we... <laughs> Right, they, they experience the presence of God, but instead of being like in awe and in wonder and excitement over the fact that like God's right there talking to Moses, they were terrified because they said to themselves, we just experienced some presence of God and anyone else that's experienced the presence of God has been struck down dead. And that's what's gonna happen to us. We're all just gonna die because God's presence is up there and we were, exper we were exposed and now we're all gonna die. So there's like a major disconnect, right? I, f I feel like um, I would hope that if I experienced the presence of God like that, I would be excited and be like, I want more instead of being like, oh, I'm gonna die, you know, fearful for my own life. Um, so... God spoke to Moses after he heard the Israelites freaking out. And he said, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments, that it might go well with them and with their children forever. Go say to them, return to your tents. But as for you, Moses, stay here and I will speak to you all my commandments, the statutes and the judgments which you shall teach them that they may observe them in the land which I am giving them to possess. So this is what God wanted Moses to tell them. Therefore, you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord has commanded you, that you may live, that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days on the land which you possess. So God's like... 
I don't want to kill you with my presence. I love you. I want you to have a real fear for me that will compel you to do what I'm asking you to do. Because what I'm asking you to do will actually bring you life. It is good for them. It will protect them, just like our kids. You know, there are times when we're like, it's really better that you don't play soccer on the road or that you put your shoes on when you go out to a construction site. Like, we know that these things will protect them. We're not trying to make their life difficult. It's because of our love for them that we want to protect them. And that's where God was at. He's like, it's for my love for you. And he even says, why? Like, sometimes... I'll say to my kids, I don't owe you an explanation. Just do it. <laughs> but, but God tells them why. He doesn't just say, obey these commandments or you will die. He actually gives them a reason why. It's so that it will go well with you. He gives them a promise within the commandments. Um, he said in Deuteronomy 6, Six through nine, and these words, words which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets before your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. God knew that if His people were to obey what He asked them to do. It had to come from the heart, not just their own strength and willpower. Because when you love someone, like a husband and wife, you desire to do things their way because you know why they like a certain thing a certain way. They know why, you know why they like a certain brand of peanut butter over the other, and you're happy to get them what they like. And when you're doing it, you're like, this is the way he likes it. So I know that when he sees that, he's going to see my love for him. But when you don't know someone and you don't have any idea why in the world they don't like this kind of peanut butter, you're like, just eat the peanut butter. Like you, you don't have a heart that is invested in that situation. And so when you don't know them, you don't really care um, to do things their way so much. Um, this thought came to me this morning, and I think we're all just a little tired, so maybe it doesn't fit in great, but Sydney was using our Amazon Echo and... Oh my goodness. If you have kids and you have one of those echo dots or those things where you, you know, you know what they are, right? Where you talk to them, they can play music for you. Well, there are some really random questions that come out in our house that comes to that. And the um, Alexa will answer with some like really, like you don't know what I was trying to ask you. Like you'll ask her a question and then she'll answer sort of and then she'll just keep going on and on about all of the information about this thing, and eventually we always, always around our house, Alexa, stop, because she just keeps talking. And, and I was like, man, maybe this is a weird analogy, but like if we are God and Alexa is people of Israel, it was just like God will impress something on our hearts, and we'll, if, if we don't know him, if we don't know his voice, if we don't know his commandments, we're like, we think that we're going off on some really amazing thing that's super helpful, but because our heart isn't invested, it's just kind of like, you don't know where I'm trying to go here. Randy, stop, please, just stop. Um, so I, I just feel like that's where the Israelites were. Their, their hearts weren't invested. Like, they knew who God was. They heard God. They saw the Red Sea part in front of them. They saw the most amazing miracles that this world has ever known, but they didn't know God in their heart. Um, so I wanted to encourage you today. Um, part of writing God's word on your heart has a lot to do with guarding our heart. And um, if only we would think about our hearts more, um, I think about the way that I take care of my house. Um, my house is not perfect, but I put a lot of time and energy into cleaning, organizing, um, pulling stuff out of a closet and getting rid of things and um, maybe redecorating or repainting. Um, like what if I had that much care and concern about everything that is in my heart? Um, 
Or either, maybe that doesn't apply to you, maybe like there's some people that are super picky about what they eat, like they only eat organic, only clean food, um, only healthy, like they would not let anything into their body that's fake food, right? But man, how, how easily we allow something to slip into our heart. And um, even with this virus, at the very beginning, I was, I was a little paranoid about every single thing that I touched, every single thing that my kids were touching. And, you know, if you did touch something, you're like, sanitize your hands. Um, maybe even still a little bit now. But, like, how quickly do we try to remove something if it slips into our heart? We're like, ah, that just, bitterness just got my heart. No, 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 wash that away. Get, that, get the Bible sanitizer. <laughs> That's so corny. Um, but I'm not saying any of that is bad. But our hearts are like a sponge. And whatever we are soaking our heart in is what it will be filled with. Have we been extra careful to not let anything into our heart like offense or bitterness, pride, selfishness? Um, And if it does sneak in, do we immediately, like, no, get back out. You will not have any place in here. Um, How Have we ever thought about what lies um, might be? we've allowed to soak into our heart that every single time we're just believing them every time and and you find yourself in the same situation you're like every time every time this happens and it's because it's because of them it's because you know we we quickly write off um write off our own responsibility in so many situations um the bible says to above all else to guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Above washing your hands, above cleaning your house, above eating healthy, those are all good things, but above all, guard your heart. That's the most important thing because everything you do comes from your heart. Um, God asks us to write his words on our heart, to tie them on our fingers. <laughs> I was like, can you just imagine like a bunch of God's words on our fingers? Just do anything and everything you possibly can to always have his truth in front of us and letting the sponge of our heart soak up every truth that is in his word because that will heal your soul. Um, Don't look to the right or to the left with the distractions of sin and selfishness and pride, but to fill your heart with God's word. So how do we write this truth on our heart? Um, there's a book that I'm reading right now called Living Among Lions, and it talks about um, being a bold Christian in today's Babylon. And uh, a quote that I read recently that really struck out, stuck out to me was, the devil knows one very important fact. How you see yourself determines how you conduct yourself. And um, the verse that started this whole message was, Proverbs 3, 3 and 4, it says, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Um, I think we have to keep mercy and truth on our heart. Mercy is always reminding us of where we've been. Mercy is us not getting what we deserve. We deserve hell, death, destruction. And God said, no, I'll I'll take that away from you. I'll die for you. His mercy puts us in a place where we have to realize that we deserve death. But his truth reminds us of who we are. We are God's children. We have his word on our heart. And the truth of God Um, is how we see ourselves. And I pray that God will reveal to you what maybe needs to be removed from your heart today, a lie that needs to be removed to replace it with God's truth Um, so that it will be well with you, so that you can have success, so that you can have um, favor with God and man. Um, Psalm 119.11 says, Your word have I treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. So 
So Jesus set the perfect example for us in every single way, but especially to me when he was tempted because he fasted for 40 days. Um, I fasted yesterday, and I, I, can't, I don't know that I did so great because I'm just like, I'm going to take a nap so that the day goes by faster. <laughs> like, I, it's hard. Fasting is hard, and I don't do it right a lot of the time. And so when he was, he was so filled up with the word of God in his heart that when he was tempted, the first thing that came out of his mouth was scripture. And that was the way he defeated the enemy. And sometimes I feel like we might think that we're better than Jesus in the way that we don't use scripture. We don't read God's word. We don't memorize it. Like, I don't memorize God's word anymore. Like, is that really only for kids? Because Jesus knew God's word. Jesus studied God's word. And if he did it, how much more should I do it? Um, So I do want to challenge you to either memorize the verse, um, Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Or find a verse that directly impacts the lie that you're believing. And every time that lie creeps up, Cast it down with the scripture, the word of God. Um, Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful. Like, just think about that. It's living and powerful. If we really believed that, we would read it, right? We would want to spend more than once a day in it. And um, it also says, It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. Like, nothing else can pierce to this division of soul and spirit. How do you you find that division other than the word of God? And to the joints and marrow, and it, it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So let his word today, tomorrow, The next day, let the word of God pierce to your heart. Let it get all of that sin out of your heart so that you can have victory. Um, Our hearts also, um, to find favor and to find um, what is pleasing to God, our hearts have to be loyal. In the Bible, all through 1st and 2nd Kings, you'll read about each different king that ruled like Judah or Israel. And it, within the first few sentences, it always says, this is king so-and-so, his mother was this lady, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Or, this is king so-and-so, his mother was so-and-so, he did, what did I say first? He did good in the eyes of the Lord. And... Um, these decision, decisions were almost always followed by, like, if it was a good king, he would destroy all of the um, idols, all of the high places of pagan worship when it was a good king. The first thing he would do was get rid of the idols. And it was always so back and forth. It was always like three good kings, two bad kings, one good king, one bad king, five bad kings, one good king. It's just like, man, why couldn't they get this right? Why couldn't they just see that things were so much better when they did what was right in the eyes of the Lord? And um, I find myself distancing myself from the Israelites, thinking that I am like, I don't have that problem. I don't worship little idols. And then I'm like, oh, wait, I'm on my phone. How long? You know, so like, like let's be real with ourselves. Let's remember um, that we are the same kind of people the Israelites were. And don't think so quickly that we aren't. Um, Don't think so quickly that we don't have idols in our heart. Um, I think think a lot of us have allowed our pride to take away, to take us to a place where many of us don't realize the mercy that we have to have, the mercy that God gave us, that we deserve sin and death. And... um, Sometimes a good way to realize if you have an idol in your heart is like, where are your thoughts? What are they constantly thinking about? 
Um, like, what do you fear losing the most? If everything in this world was stripped away from you, all your earthly possessions and all of your titles and job, like, would you still know that you have a purpose? Because we do. No matter what job we have, no matter what money we have, our purpose is the same. Um, so in the Bible, there talks a lot about threshing floors. And it was just on my heart so strong to talk about the threshing floor. And what they do is they take stalks at harvest and they, they lay them on the threshing floor. And they usually use, they would use like a tool to hit them real hard to let the, um, the fruit come out. And then, um, or sometimes they would use an animal to crush them. But then the wind would blow away the chaff and what you're left with is the grain. And um, I don't, it's definitely not a new saying that when we are under pressure, what's inside is what comes flowing out. You know, when we're frustrated, when we're stressed out, when um, we have a lot of, of pressure on us, what flows out of us is what's really in our heart. And um, the story of, there's a story in the Bible of David, First Chronicles 21. He chooses to number the people. And I think um, the source of that was pride. Um, and this angered God because all along, the strength of Israel was never in their numbers. It was always in the God who fought for them. So when they chose, he chose to number the people, it was like he was taking his eyes off God and looking at himself and looking at his army and his people. And um, when God saw this, he sent an angel to destroy the people with a plague. And when David saw this angel over Jerusalem with his sword drawn, he immediately repented. Um, and then the angel commanded him to go build an altar for, to the Lord on a threshing floor. So he buys this threshing floor, offers burnt offerings and peace offerings, and he called on the Lord, and the Lord answered him from heaven by fire on the altar of the burnt offering. So David had sin in his heart. He had pride, and he tried he was, he was tried with this plague. You know, he was put under pressure. He's a king. He made a bad choice. And he, he was tried with this plague that killed 70,000 of his people. And so what came out of him through this trial was repentance. On the threshing floor where he offered his sacrifice to God, the chaff of his sin was blown away. And all that was left was a pure, broken, soft-hearted, humbled, forgiven king. And people so quickly say, you know, when you think of David, you think of man after God's own heart, right? That's what we all say. But why was his heart a man after God's own heart? It's like, man, he had sin. But David had God's truth written on the tablet of his heart. He loved God's law. Read um, Psalm 119, and you'll see how much David loved the word of God. He was loyal. He was obedient. He was full of faith. As a young man, he took on Goliath. Um, he worshiped God and not idols. He wasn't perfect. We all know that. But when he was presented with his sin, he repented. He repented quickly, and he repented wholeheartedly. Um, he didn't let pride rule in his heart and fight back. He saw the condition of his heart and knew that he needed to repent. Um, I feel like the church as a whole is on a threshing floor. We are being put under a lot of pressure, and I think we'll see even more pressure. And what's coming out of us is showing the condition of our heart. <clears throat> um, will we be like David? Will we quickly repent when we see, when God reveals to us what's in our heart? Or will we be full of pride and argue and, and prove our point and say, no, we didn't, or whatever? Um, we are asked to keep mercy and truth 
ever before us. Remember where we've been and remember who we are and keep that in your heart all the time. Um, Then we will have the kind of heart that God is searching for. And I, just knowing what happened last night, knowing that we are having victory and we are making a difference in the spiritual realm. We have power. We have authority. We can't forget that. But we also can't forget that we are part of a nation that has turned away from God. And just like David, uh, sorry, Daniel, when he was in Babylon, he, he maybe didn't have a lot of sin in his heart. I mean, he was a human, but he bowed down and he repented for the sins of the country, uh, the sins of where he was at. And I think sometimes we have to realize that we are part of America. And some of the problems that are going on have happened because we haven't done what we need to do. And we need to get on our knees and repent for, for the lives that are being taken through abortion, through, through these horrible things that are happening. We all have to humbly come to God and see that we are not above anyone else. Um, so I'm going to pray. And um, I just encourage you, as Johnny plays the last song, that, um, that you would search your heart. No one's judging you. We all, we all want to see all of you have victory in your life so that it may be well with you, so that you can have um, a good life filled with many days which God has planned for you. So please just cast down that pride today and come to the altar if God is speaking to you.